history. From this era, everyone is a beast. What sets them apart is how well they fight and adapt to survive for the next few generations. Or in the case of dinosaurs, if your bones are still intact and we put you back together just because we think you're cool. With that said, how easy is it to name a prehistoric boss in a video game that's not just a T-Rex? You'd think there'd be more of these. There ain't. <laughs> Yeah, in case you can't tell, this started out as dinosaur bosses, but oftentimes when the other shoe drops in the writer's room, we had to broaden the scope to prehistory in general. In addition to dinosaurs, we have other prehistoric animals, sapient colonies, and so on. We'll be trying to avoid mythological entities such as dragons, since those are easily their own category. The rules are the same as ever. How good is the boss fight and how well do they play with the theme of prehistory? And just to clarify, the time period when you fight these bosses doesn't really matter since a lot of these bosses do tend to be resurrected in present time. So if they can adapt the elements well into their design, background, and gameplay, that's all they really need to qualify. So with that in mind, welcome to Prehistoric Bosses. Yeah, enjoy this ad. Before we get started, holy crap, you guys. We fully funded the Waifu Hample Kickstarter in 33 minutes. And since then, we've hit the 50K stretch goal, which means we've got new races, expanded classes, new dockies, and more sub races. For those not in the know, this is a D&D 5e and Pathfinder 1e and 2e supplement book if you want to spice up your campaigns with waifu inspired classes, NPCs, ancestries, and an easily understandable cooking system along with teamwork mechanics. Supporting the Kickstarter can net you rewards such as the MP3 of the theme song Roll for Waifu, digital, softcover, or hardcover books, a pillow plush, dockies, designing a recipe, or even, dare I say, build a waifu to be featured in the book. We got some great stretch goals as well, including mythic paths, new artworks, new dockies, equipment, spells, expanded cooking, maybe even a second volume. Remember, supporting this project also supports my channel. Thank you all so much for listening and back to your regularly scheduled content. Keep the dockies away from me. Get your bingo cards ready. Is a prehistoric boss really prehistoric if you fight it in its own time? Yes, the answer is yes. But I couldn't think of a witty opening statement that didn't just boil down to a prehistoric meme. I'm a oh. Maybe I'm the prehistoric one here. Anyway, no list of dino bosses, I, I mean prehistoric bosses, would be complete without talking about a boss from one of the classic JRPGs of yesteryear, Chrono Trigger. I'm of course talking about Black Toronto. The fight begins with Azala bringing forth the Black Tyranno in an attempt to snuff the party out. One final act of defiance as the Red Star falls on the world and dooms the dinosaurs in the prehistoric era. As far as final acts of defiance go, can't falter for style. Nothing says style like a giant mother frickin' T-Rex. I'm a mother T-Rex! Especially one that breathes fire! Effectiveness, on the other hand, 4 out of 10, I'm sorry. It's a shame because Black Toronto has everything it needs to be a strong, challenging boss fight. It has a charge move in Toronto Flame and has a way to heal itself by chomping on a party member, and Toronto Flame takes five whole turns to charge and does comparatively paltry damage for how long the windup takes. What was that? That was the worst fire bending I've ever seen. And Chomp just isn't used frequently enough and doesn't do enough damage to really become a major issue. You know, just a small tweak in damage numbers, a turn or two less wind up on its charge move, and maybe an AI modifier to pick on one specific party member with Chomp and Black Toronto would have been a challenging, if still not very deep fight. Oh yeah, I guess Azala fights with Black Toronto at the beginning of the battle with some psychokinesis, but this list isn't about the Dino Queen. She's barely an afterthought in the fight and leaves after taking a few hits. On the bright side, Black Toronto somehow survives the meteor and goes on to become Rust Toronto in the Middle Ages. Or so the legend goes. It's an unwritten law for adapting dinosaurs that the Tyrannosaurus Rex reigns supreme. I don't blame them. The T-Rex is awesome and... Terrifying in more ways than one. Honey, hide the kids! But 
it's kind of overplayed at this point. How about giving a different dinosaur a seat on the throne? Apparently, Banjo Tooie thought the same thing because for their prehistoric themed level, they made the big end boss a pterodactyl named Terry. I repress my urge to groan only because it's a Banjo Kazooie game. Terry here is a single father whose eggs have gone missing. He notices our dynamic duo and believes they stole his unborn children. To be fair, he's got probable cause. They try to appeal to Terry, but he's gone full Papa Wolf and is hovering above hawking loogies at you. So you shoot him until he sicks his sentient snot buddies at you. Okay. Then get rid of these guys and just repeat the process until Terry gives up. But after you beat him, you finally clear things up with them and agree to help him find his kids later on. Find them all and you win a jiggy. Sadly, I can't picture myself putting Terry any higher. He's constantly airborne and his only attacks are him puking on you or getting his snot buddies to gang up on you. Adding to it, it's a lot easier to dodge his attacks once you get the hang of it. But credit where credit is due. I like how he's more involved gameplay wise since you'll be helping him out later. And I can't blame him for being a concerned parent. Plus he actually knows not to dive headfirst into battle. How my Rock King would benefit from such a lesson? Man, Jurassic Park, the franchise that dared to ask the question, what happens if you decide to play God and revive the dinosaurs? The answer? Don't do it! One of their movies, The Lost World, was mixedly received. However, one definite cool thing that came out of it, the arcade game, a 3D rail shooter that has the player trapped on the abandoned island of Ilesorna. Your mission, traverse five different environments across the island to find the two missing doctors and fight your way through an ensemble of dinosaurs. At one point, you find yourself in the plant control center. You find the doctors, but there's something else here. Something that can hide in plain sight! No, it's all good. It's fine. Wasn't, wasn't planning on sleeping again for the rest of my life! No, that's not a trick of the eyes. That's a dinosaur that can turn invisible. Yep, the game beat Jurassic World to the punch. More specifically, this is a dinosaur ripped straight from the Lost World novel, A Carnotaurus. It looks like a miniature T-Rex, but it's been given chameleon genetics, meaning it can camouflage. And it's got buggy eyes, which makes it look even freakier. Oh, and it's a fast runner that wants to take a bite out of you, so get ready! With how immersive the game is, you genuinely feel like you're trapped and at the mercy of these giant thunder lizards. The fact that this one can turn invisible makes the fight feel even more suspenseful. Honestly, the only reason it's this low is, well, aside from the invisibility, it's kind of a basic fight. You're trying to tranquilize a dinosaur while running for your life. Doesn't sound too exciting on paper. The cinematic experience you get during the fight more than makes up for it. For now, let's just all be thankful no one's actually tried to play God and bring these things back to life. Yet. Okay, hear me out. A ninja fighting a T-Rex. Jumping the shark? Who cares? If they're gonna tie this game's lore to frickin' dead or alive, we might as well enjoy our Japanese burger. In Team Ninja's Ninja Gaiden 3, your antagonist is the cult known as the Lords of Alchemy. They specialize in a wide array of technological advancements, ranging from military weapons to biological experiments to dental products. I knew Colgate was evil the whole time. I'm on to you, Alir. Among their many attempts to force Ryu Hayabusa to surrender, one of their leaders, the Regent of the Mask, sends an entire T-Rex after him. A Gigantosaurus, to be exact. I guess that makes it a G-Rex? Is that how it works? The first phase of the fight pits you in head-to-head -head combat with the living fossil, where you cut through its ankles as it tries to smack and stomp you. Eventually, it'll harden its legs, so you have to switch to attacking the head. The second phase is a cinematic chase scene that ends with you blowing up a missile in its mouth, tearing off the hard shell, and leaving it right for a finishing blow. As stupid crazy as this fight is, it's certainly a feast for the senses. However, it does have some issues that hold it back a bit. Its attack cycle is not nearly as diverse as other bosses in the game, so you can get it to just ram you repeatedly until it falls down, where you can take a good chunk of its health out with the right weapons. Also, in the original version of the game, you don't see its health bar, so you'll more than likely find yourself wailing on this boss a lot, not realizing you're not doing damage to it where you should. Thankfully, Razor's Edge fixed that. 
Gigantosaurus may have been one of the weaker bosses in the game, but considering we don't see enough in-your-face battles with the King of Dinos, what we got here ain't half bad. I mean, it's still more respectful than the game that comes after. There's a reason Dead or Alive is a separate game, you know? When it comes to settings in RPGs, the most common are usually modern or fantasy with varying degrees of hybrid. Thankfully, for those seeking more variety, we have Live Alive, specifically the prehistoric chapter, journey back to a simpler time where rock and roll was just rock and people had no need for words. Of course, no tale of prehistory would be complete without a face-off against a good old dinosaur. Odo has long been worshipped as a deity by the Ku tribe and has been appeased through sacrifices. It just so happens that his latest sacrifice, Baru, is the love interest of our main hero of the chapter, Pogo. So I guess he's getting a butt whooping. Oh, and in classic shonen fashion, Zaki, who had been your rival up to this point, joins you for the battle. That's pretty fun. And being, well, a dinosaur, Odo hits like a sapient freight train. You really have to work as a team to take him down healing with Baru, debuffing with Gori, and attacking with the others. Or you could just cheese him by spamming Singhurt. Man, all this talk of history really makes me want a Depression-era JRPG. I was kidding! Not much else is to be said about this boss, but that don't make it bad. It's primitive, haha, but the threat it poses makes the teamwork recommended to beat it all the more rewarding. There's a chance most players would start off with the prehistory chapter, so facing Odo serves as a good standard challenge to cap off an effectively simple chapter like this one. Still not the weakest form of Odeo, oddly enough. Billions of years prior to the events of Ark, there was a beast who rose upon the earth and brought with it a world-ending army. The beast is known as the King Titan. What remains of life on earth since then is evacuated through the Ark in the hopes that one day they will become strong enough to take the earth back from these monsters of the element. The King Titan is introduced as a boss in the Extinction DLC of Ark Survival Evolved. It's regarded as the single most powerful boss in the game. Even just trying to summon this thing requires you to have the remnants of the other lesser titans. The result shows it is the biggest creature in the game, towering up to 500 feet and boasting one and a half million hit points. It can shoot meteors and fireballs, summon an army of corrupted dinosaurs, and its stomps and punches are powerful enough to send even the biggest creatures and mechs flying. You definitely have to bring some of your best machines and tame beasts if you want any chance of even scratching this thing. Don't even think about running too far away from it either, because if you don't have its attention, it'll approach the center of the arena and regenerate. At an absolutely gorgeous score, playing as the king tramples about, and you get a scene fit for a legendary giant. Now, as awesome as all of this sounds, the fight is only as fun as it is in multiplayer, since you'll actually get to support and strategize with each other more. Not to mention getting reliable healing where it matters. On single player, it's kind of a big sluggish grind. All you do is get the best things available and throw it all at the lumbering monster until one of you gets pummeled to the ground. Sure, you do have to think about selecting the right creatures and bringing the right equipment with you, but the execution is mostly the same. With that said, this is still a fight worth winning as the drops you get from it are some of the best in the game, and they only get better from the beta and alpha variants of the boss. Yeah, while the fight can be tedious if you don't know what you're doing, having a decent amount of options to approach it definitely makes it more engaging than it otherwise would have been. Hey, you wanna see something cool? Far Cry Primal is a prehistoric take on the series that is a from the settings of the original, but it's a very much welcomed one. With creatures like Bloodfang Sabretooth, the Snowblood Wolf, and the Blood Tusk Mammoth, you'd think one of them would be the best pick for the list, but no. In fact, I'd argue the best fights you get are against the two main antagonists of the game, Ul and Batari. Ul is the war chief of Udam, a tribe of cannibalistic Neanderthals who prey on nearby rival tribes, including your own. Yeah, he's got a reputation for being savage, but due to the deteriorating health of his tribe, 
he believed their actions were necessary for survival. And in a lawless world of prehistory, morals are about as subjective as it gets. You face off against Ool in his icy shelter. You're in for a full on gang fight as he has the company of his fellow tribesmen to ambush you from the walls. You can choose to take them head on or fire at the stalactites above them to damage them via stage hazards. Either way, you have a lot of options to ward off this ambush and you better make the most out of it. And after all that, Ool with his dying breath is ready to take the rest of the tribe away with him, but he can't. He still holds hope for his children and wishes for you to care for them in his stead. Even in a world where morality is subjective, the man still shows genuine care for the tribe he put his whole life into leading. I mean, hey, it's more respectable than the other villain. Batari, in contrast, is a much less sympathetic matriarch to the Sun Tribe of Azila. She abuses the tribe's religious devotion so she can control them as their high priestess, all the while killing and enslaving the other tribe's folk. She even killed her son Krati for revolting against her and made a myth out of him, keeping the tribe under her guidance through fear. Towards the end of the game, you put on Krati's mask to scare off the Azila tribe, but then Batari tears it off you and the final battle begins. Batari doesn't fight you quite as head on as Ul did. She prefers to take cover behind her flaming effigies and strike you with arrows from afar. Like Ul, her fellow soldiers assist her on that front, but you can conveniently use all the fire she throws around against them. Think it's about time y'all pray to a different rock? Finally, you give the witch a taste of her own medicine and send her to the literal pits of fire where her son awaits. It's interesting to see how far these tribes would go to survive in the harsh environment of their time. One willing to slaughter out of desperate care for his kin, and the other taking pride in abusing the weak to ensure her own safety. And their battles reflect that perfectly, with Ul leading an active charge while Batari hides behind smokes and straws. Either way, to honor one and oppose the other is part of what makes these tribes human. And no matter how much time passes and ethics evolve, these values stay true. Okay, full disclosure, it was really difficult to find entries for this list because, weirdly, people don't do the dino aesthetic much. Well, luckily for us, JRPGs love bringing these weird freaking dino type creatures to the forefront. Wait, 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 we already talked about Black Toronto, didn't we? So who's- Hey, yo! Oh! <laughs> so if E7 was all about dragons, E8 brings along these creatures known as ancient species. I mean, Primordials as the main enemy class in the game. You have your normal raptor variant and pterodactyl variant, and hey, you even get some more docile versions of dinosaurs running around too. But who's the real king of these ancient marvels? Well, let's take a look under, under the, the sea. sea for some inspiration, shall we? Ease Eight's premise is that you are shipwrecked and are trapped on an island with something preventing you from leaving. Yes, I'm aware it's the same premise from Ease One and Six. Shut up. Instead of storm barriers, this time it's a giant squid called Oceanus. You spend most of the game pretty much searching the whole island, finally finding its lair, the Arceus Hook. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Arceus Chasm. After your fellow castaways injure the big palooka, it retreats to its alcove where a doll and friends are waiting to slay it. The fight is pretty intense as not only do you need to fight something of that size, you need to do it in a hurry. It plays similarly to the village defense missions where you need to do damage to reduce the strain of monsters on your fellow castaways as they fight off a separate horde. Oceanus attacks by launching its tentacles at you, sending shockwaves, ink that can blind you, and will even suck you into its mouth and chomp on you. To beat it, you need to use the bombs that are nearby and launch them at the thing's head. Afterward, it gets stunned, allowing you to wail at its weak point. Wait, why does this sound like a Zelda fight? Eh, it's awesome, who cares? While this fight is great in scale, it can be a little wonky as you're a little slower in the water and the arena is huge. This leads to points where Oceanus is just standing around as you wait for the AI to come down and follow your character. Plus the attacks can be easy to avoid with such a large arena, though they do a lot of damage, so be careful if you do get hit. Oceanus is a fight built up throughout the game as one of the tentacles was the first encounter you had. Between the large scale of the battle, seeing your fellow castaways and you work together to combat it, and the implications behind its existence you find out later in the story, it's a fantastic fight. And now you have food for all the castaways. Hope they like calamari for the next year. There's enough fried calamari out there to feed the whole of Italy. <laughs> mm. 
man, we really spent most of this list talking about a lot of different franchises we either don't talk about much or for the first time ever. I need something more familiar. All right, Monster Hunter, where are you at? Okay, fans of the franchise, tell me you didn't see this coming. With all the variety of monsters that this series has, it isn't surprising that we have a few that are based on the occasional dinosaur. And while you might expect some massive world calamity-esque elder dragon, sometimes we just need a T-Rex with a head cold. And Janath is one of the new monsters introduced in World, and it left a big impact from the beginning. It was one of the first big roadblocks, and usually the monster that got players to either get good or return their copy back to GameStop. Never mind the fact that it's literally just a T-Rex. We have silver wind dragons, world-eating snakes, and lightning unicorns. And yet, they decide to just make a giant jumping T-Rex that sends snot <laughs> rockets at you. What? You thought that head cold joke didn't mean anything? Yeah, it will send <laughs> snot rockets that can stun you. Weird that it happened twice. Also, it breeds fire, because why not? While it hasn't been around too long, Anjanath did get a variant in Iceborne in the form of Vulgar Anjanath. He loses the fire breath, but gains lightning powers, and those <laughs> snot rockets become a lightning-infused snot rockets. <laughs> that can paralyze you. And while Anjanath did get earlier in Rise, as did most monsters, the Curio investigations can make it way stronger and give it the ability to inflict blood blight. Don't underestimate them! Anjanath may not have any story importance or world-ending lore like the other monsters we talked about, but it makes up for a part being a good prehistoric boss fight that's fine. <laughs> it's challenging, keeps you on your toes, and prehistoric themed. What more do we need for the list? Awizolo, <laughs> Ocean Hunter. After a slew of oversized fish, here's a bona fide sea dino to spice things up. Bullbox, Evo Search for Eden. This morbid blob of genes calls itself the very first human. Rather poetic, honestly. King Dodongo, various Zelda. No matter where he is or what form he takes, he always hates smoke. Tricky the Triceratops, Diddy Kong Racing. Monkeys racing dinosaurs, a hilarious, like, grueling survival allegory. Red Eye, Star Fox Adventures. The fight itself is pretty tense and cool, but I believe JonTron put it best. What is this? And why is it in my Star Fox game? Okay, dude, lighten up for real. If you're really looking for a game that celebrates all things prehistory, there's really not a better choice out there than the often overlooked DS title, Fossil Fighters. On the surface, it just seems like a Pokemon ripoff, but with a Jurassic coat of paint. Oh, you're collecting elemental creatures at the behest of a scientist to be the best like no one ever was in a competitive battling sport. And there's also an evil team that steals creatures. And there's a bunch of quirky rival characters to boot. Hmm. But, 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 there's actually more to it when we really peel back the layers. There's a bit of strategy with how you position your revived dinosaurs, or vivisaurs, and what support effects you and your opponent have depending on your team comp. Plus, it's not just T-Rexes and Stegosauruses you're playing with, no, 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 no. This game has an interesting roster of prehistoric creatures not limited to dinosaurs. But even further than that, the story takes a turn after you defeat what seems like the main villain and is totally not legendary Pokemon. To make a long story short, it turns out Duna, a mysterious girl you've met across your journey, is an alien. And not just any old alien, but a dinosaur alien. Meet the Dinarians, an ancient alien race with the ability to turn into larger saurian forms. After their planet got galactus by a giant Pac-Man monster, they took to the stars to find a planet suitable for repopulating their species. And surprise, surprise, they landed on Earth. And their king dino seeded the planet with life. Life that, as it turns out, went extinct millions of years ago. Yep, that's right. In this universe, dinosaurs came from alien DNA. I knew it. Dino sees humanity as undeserving to call itself the dominant species and challenges you to a duel to decide the fate of the planet. And what a battle it is. Up until now, Fossil Fighters hasn't been too challenging if you know what you're doing, but Dino plays very smart. To start, both he and his robotic minions are typeless, meaning that they don't carry an elemental weakness to exploit, and Dino's support effects are crippling debuffs to your own team. 
being that you need to switch your zones to deal any real damage to him or his minions. This would be simple if it wasn't for Dino's ability to affect you with Excite and Poison, keeping you locked from switching and forcing you to take insane damage if you can't. Not to mention that, since his team is all the same type, he can pelt you with huge super moves that hit your entire team. Defeating him requires making a team that can counter his massive debuffs either by forcing him to switch or having a Vivisaur that can hit through the support zone where his debuffs aren't active. You need to play as smart as he does to prove humanity's right to inherit the Earth. Once you do defeat him, he humbly accepts that maybe humanity isn't so bad and so desires an alliance between humans and Dinorians, an alliance that becomes quite fortuitous when his Starscream cohort wrapped him, jumps the gun, and summons the monster that destroyed their planet in the first place. Oops! He also gets not one, but two post-game fights that turn out to be even harder than the first one, pushing the same strategy further and the game's own mechanics to the absolute limit. What puts Dino at the top spot isn't just the difficulty of the fight, but the impact of what it means in the larger story. Dino isn't just a king of an alien race that resembles dinosaurs, he's THE king of dinosaurs, responsible for their existence in the first place. And when you prove superior, he's more than willing to pass the torch, in a sense, letting the old make way for the new, and accepting that prehistory can be left as prehistory. I'm the Fiery Joker and... Oh, that's an omen if there ever was one. Cut. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Pop Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.